Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, this is the USC Institute for Integrative Health and Wellness Quarterly Symposium. And my name is Jeffrey Gold. I am the director of the USC IIHW, and we appreciate you joining us during your lunch hour today. Our title today is called Integrative Virtual Reality in Healthcare. And you can see your EADS code right here, 74ARAK, for your uh, continuing medical education. Our mission here at the USC IIHW is to promote the health and healing of individuals, families, and communities that we serve through the advancement and practice of integrative health, the science upon which it is based, and the education of healthcare practitioners and the USC community. Our vision is to transform healthcare by establishing a collaborative holistic paradigm that promotes health and healing and integrates all aspects of human life, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, cultural, social, and environmental. We like to read our land acknowledgement to uh, from the uh, Institute of Integrative Health and Wellness at USC and also Children's Hospital Los Angeles acknowledges our presence on the traditional and ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabriolino Tongva peoples. We recognize that these people were forcibly removed from their homelands, and we take this opportunity to acknowledge the generations that have gone before as well as the present day Gabrielino Tongva people. With humility, we recognize and respect all indigenous people, their histories and their ties to the land. We like to pay respect for past and present and let this acknowledgement serve as an ongoing reminder of the original inhabitants where you reside. Again, I wanna remind you about EADS. Um, if you do or don't have the code, you can access it on your phone by using this QR code. Um, or uh, going to the website and downloading EADS so that you can get your continuing medical education. I want to acknowledge our executive steering committee uh, who, are who are named here at, from USC University Park Campus as well as Health Science Campus and here at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. Special thanks and shout out to Nat and Chelsea and Michaela who help us to organize these quarterly symposiums and to keep our institute uh, going forward, as well as Dean Sony. Please uh, join our mailing list so you can hear about our new, our upcoming quarterly symposiums and, and other research and educational activities within the USC IIHW. All right, so again, I wanna thank you all for joining us today. I am gonna pass the mic over to Dr. Yasek Pinsky, who will be speaking with you about virtual reality. And I will stop sharing so he can start to share. Perfect. And I will mute myself so he can take over the, the mic. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Pinsky. Just one second. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for, to everyone for participating in this program. I will be speaking to you as a medical oncologist uh, who treats mostly G, uh, patients with GU malignancies, but also as a director of the Institute for Arts in Medicine. Just a little just a little background on the Institute for Arts in Medicine. Everything started with just an idea, an idea to converge two disciplines, which on the surface appear to have very little in common, arts and medicine. The idea was to deploy and clinically assess creative therapies in patient care thereby bridging the divide between art, science, and medicine. The inspiration for this concept came from my realization as a medical oncologist and cancer researcher that although basic and clinical research with new drugs is important and may sometimes result in improved clinical outcomes for patients, addressing and preventing the negative psychological aspects caused by the disease and the therapy itself should be of equal importance. Art is about healing and so much more than what we commonly define and celebrate. In patient care, it uh, could be a companion to treating the whole person, a holistic approach that addresses and prevents the negative aspects of the disease, such as anxiety and depression. Now, patients with cancer often experience severe psychological symptoms such as anxiety and depression. Poor mental health has been associated with worse <clears throat> treatment adherence, 
decrease quality of life and increase risk of cancer associated mortality. On average, one in five patients will be found to suffer from post-traumatic uh, stress disorder, uh, sometimes happening even years after the initial diagnosis was made. Other interventions have been shown to improve quality of life and improve on some of the negative psychological symptoms, such as anxiety, depression, and pain. A systemic review of more than 70 clinical trials, totaling more than 5,000 patients, uh, <clears throat> comp uh, has shown that compared with standard care, music therapy has beneficial effects on pain, quality of life, anxiety, depression, fatigue. Also art making, such as sculpturing on pain and, or painting, have been shown to enhance uh, diversion and pleasure, self-management of pain, a sense of control, and improve social relationships. About three years ago, we started the Institute of Arts in Medicine, which is based on six divisions, which are based on music, visual, and language art, research, technology, and big part of technology is VR, as well as outreach and documentation. Each of the division is in charge of several programs, uh, such as music infusion or poetry for patients. In the music infusion program, patients who get admitted to the hospital to receive chemotherapy are offered to compose an original song or write original lyrics with the help of our musicians in residence. This is a very time intensive program which allows the patient to be diverted from the negative uh, negativity of uh, cancer to do something posi positive such as uh, music uh, creation. Now research uh, on this topic uh, to demonstrate the clinical benefit of those intervention is critical to show that they actually do improve uh, clinical outcomes. Uh, currently we have ongoing phase two clinical trials. The plan is to conduct in future larger prospective studies uh, which will be multidisciplinary involve uh, participate uh, participation of other agencies as well. So what is virtual reality? Virtual reality is a technology that uh, uses computer generated simulation to create a lifelike and immerse experience for users. It involves the use of specialized headsets. The VR headsets typically consist of high resolution display that cover the user's field of view, uh, as well as motion tracking sensors uh, to monitor the user's head movements. This allows the virtual environment to respond to the user's actions, making the experience feel more realistic and interactive. To further enhance the immersive experience, VR systems may also include handheld controllers or gloves that enable users to interact with objects and manipulate the virtual world. Now, the, uh, the virtual reality headsets have several characteristics. Feathered VR headsets require a connection to a powerful gaming PC or console to operate. They typically offer high quality graphics and a more immersed experience. Standalone VR headsets have their own built-in processing power and do not need to be connected to an external device. Mobile VR headsets use a smartphone as the display and processing unit. Many modern VR headsets use inside-out tracking where cameras on the headset itself track the movement of the user and the controllers. The type of design of controllers can vary significantly between different VR headsets. Some offer basic handheld controllers while others provide more advanced ergonomic designs uh, uh, such as uh, finger tracking. Resolution of field of view or FOV refers to the clarity of visual, visuals. 
higher resolution and wider FOV generally contribute to a more immersed experience. VR headsets differ in terms of weight, padding, and adjustability, affecting comfort during extended use. Now, art and music therapy have proven beneficial toward reducing pain and anxiety and improving quality of life of cancer patients. The overuse of prescription medications and their related toxicity burdens patients, providers, and healthcare resources. Therefore, the uh, diversion. Uh, Therefore, devising of alternative forms of pain management is an important and very new field of research. Research has shown that VR can be effective in reducing pain during painful medical procedures, such as venipuncture, wound care, and burn dressings. A systemic review of 20 studies on VR as an analgesic for acute and chronic pain in patients concluded that VR is a very effective treatment for reducing acute pain. Patients who use virtual reality during medical procedures report, uh, report higher levels of satisfactions and are more likely to comply, uh, to comply with future procedures. So in addition to be beneficial in uh, addressing acute and chronic pain, VR has been also utilized in other areas of medicine, for example, in the setting of rehabilitation in patients after stroke, but also in patients with a variety of neurological diseases such as Parkinson or Alzheimer's disease. We are currently conducting a randomized phase two clinical trial in patients with malignant hemato uh, with he with, uh, with malignant uh, uh, hematologic uh, conditions uh, who undergo painful uh, procedures such as bone marrow biopsy or lumbar puncture. In this study, patients are randomized to either standard of care arms or virtual reality arms. So the protocol. Uh, uh, the objective of the, of the protocol is to assess the feasibility of VR during those procedures and to obtain estimates of pain levels, anxiety levels in those patients, and also to measure biomarkers associated with stress and pain. So the goal is to enroll 30 patients in each cohort. We hypothesize a decrease in pain, anxiety, and stress levels peri and post procedure in the VR arm group compared to the non-VR group. Now here you can see some of the inclusion exclusion criteria. So the old patient have to have evidence of a hematologic malignancy and have to be seen at one of our USC Norris comprehensive cancer clinics patients who have an underlying uh, diagnosis or a neurologic uh, diseases such as Parkinson's disease or, or Alzheimer's disease or dementia are excluded from the clinical trial as a patient uh, with visual impairments. Also patients who have a chronic pain or a frequent uh, uh, anxiety uh, attack problems are also excluded from the clinical trial. In this study calendar, you can see that the patients are being assessed for anxiety and pain before, during, and after the procedure. Biomarkers are being collected before and afterwards. The equipment used for VR consists of an Oculus Go headset. Uh, the VR content uh, 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 is based on relaxation and meditation videos. We are using uh, uh, visual analog scales for, to measure pain and anxiety in those patients. In addition, we are collecting biomarkers such as cortisol, which have been shown to be uh, changed or affected uh, in situation of stress and pain as well as in, uh, in, uh, in patients who uh, have anxiety. 
So what's the status of the clinical trial? So far, about 60% of patients have been en enrolled, and we expect to complete enrollment in about three to six months. Now let's talk a, lot, a little about music, the impact of music on pain and anxiety. Uh, as a music can be a very effective non-pharmacological intervention in those situations. A systemic review, including 26 randomized clinical trials, totaling over 2,000 participants, found that music interventions can significantly reduce preoperative anxiety in patients. Another systemic meta-analysis of 73 randomized controlled trials with a total of more than 7,000 participants found that music can reduce pain, anxiety, as well as opioid use in the post-operative post setting as well. So music can affect the pain through a variety of mechanisms, for example, by modulating the emotional cognitive responses to pain. Music can distract attention from, from pain and reduce the level of pain-related thoughts and feelings. Music can also activate the brain's reward and the pleasure centers, uh, for example, in the prefrontal context, which released the uh, hormones like dopamine that can produce feelings of pleasure and euphoria and reduce pain perceptions. The neural correlate of mute-induced analgesia using functional MRI have been identified in a specific area in the brain, for example, in the left cerebellum. In this study, subject pain ratings um, have, uh, have been assessed uh, in response to painful stimuli in, participate, in participants exposed to liked or disliked music. Pain can induce activation in certain areas, very specific areas in the brain, and uh, in patients who are exposed to like music, the activation of those areas significantly lower as compared to the control arm. While patients who are exposed to dislike music, there is not much difference between controls and, uh, and uh, this group. So we are currently planning to a larger phase three clinical trial. We are also applying for funding for that in patients who will undergo prostate biopsies at our urology clinic. The patients will be randomized to four arms, the VR, VR arm only, music arm only, music and VR, as well as a controller. So the hypothesis, we hypothesize a decrease in pain, anxiety, and stress hormone levels, peri and post procedures, in the music arm compared to the non-music arm, and that the combination of music and VR will be most effective. With this last, last slide, uh, uh, I would like to thank uh, my collaborators on this project. Thank you very much. And I will now hang uh, hand over uh, my presentation to Dr. Uh, Gold. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Pinsky. Great work, really very innovative and creative and appreciated the presentation. Um, if you have any questions specifically for Dr. Pinsky, please put them into the Q&A and we will get to those um, at the end of the presentation. I'm gonna start sharing my screen now. Okay, terrific. All right. Wonderful. Again, thank you so much for coming today and spending your lunch with us. Uh, I'll be talking about digital therapeutics, specifically virtual reality for pediatric clinical research. So my, my area is going to focus a little bit more on pediatric specifically, but we'll dovetail with a variety of the work that Dr. Pinsky has mentioned. Uh, I want to thank my supporters, a variety of supporters that have worked with us here at Children's and at USC to develop um, our VR uh, research uh, laboratory. Let's ask ourselves a couple of questions quickly. Uh, what is the relationship of stress, which is a mind-body phenomenon, and our physical health, which is stress can manifest both in your mind and also physically? And do children with chronic health needs undergo who, who undergo routine daily, weekly, or monthly scary, painful, distressing 
medical procedures experience high levels of stress and therefore have more health-related problems or things that we call ACEs, which are adverse childhood experiences. So a lot of the work around VR is what can we do to decrease or eliminate the risk of causing additional ACEs or stress or harm to children who require regular routine care that is painful? Uh, can VR or AR augmented reality decrease stress and pain and anxiety in patients undergoing necessary painful medical procedures? So we've seen VR used in a variety of ways, both in entertainment and surgery, and again, in the military, as well as in therapy. And you can see this has been dating back to the 1940s, 1950s, where you can see the inter integration of virtual reality for training, for simulation, for education, um, and now for therapeutic purposes. The evolution of VR, you can see here dating back into the 1960s, shows the development of different VR technologies. And as, as Dr. Pinsky mentioned, some hand controllers and also arm movement and et cetera, with a variety of different hardware coming all the way to 2023 with the Oculus Quest 3, which has been recently uh, released. But you can see things like Google Cardboard, Oculus Go, Gear VR, and a variety of other technologies that are available off the shelf now. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, virtual reality and augmented reality were identified as innovations in pediatric health specifically, and uh, more resources have been poured into the development of VR for pain, for anxiety, for rehabilitation. I'm going to share this video with you so you can get a sense of the scope of virtual reality. Mm -hmm. Where kids are hospitalized over long periods of time, who feel isolated, who feel alone who feel anxiety or depression, to get that child outside of their room and engage that in society or in the world would be a wonderful experience for the kids, especially when they just felt sort of stuck in a hospital for a long period of time. Part of how we were taught other people go to my What goes on in the imagination has profound physiologic effects. So if we were to give people a euphoric virtual reality experience while they're undergoing chemotherapy or dialysis, the immersiveness of the experience to take it to such a level, we'll even know how many different applications in medicine might find it beneficial. Walking into a hospital like this and not knowing face is a very scary situation. So imagine that a uh, virtual reality type environment could be delivered and they can actually start to go through what that experience might be like in a first person experience. It's powerful and transformative in the sense that you have the knowledge, you have the information, and you will then be more prepared for being able to go through that procedure than you were when somebody just told you the diagnosis and they were on the right hand. Surgery is a 360 experience today. It's an experience that, and that we do with anything else in life. We experience uh, things around us. Decades ago, a doctor could come in, you can, uh, you can have a visiting professor approach you and how to do the operation better. That's almost virtually impossible now. Uh, so we use virtual reality to bring those uh, professors into the operating room uh, along with us so they can see what we're doing. They can have the same information available to them. This is really the future classroom in terms of uh, being able to bring people into the operating room experience what we're experiencing to perform good surgery and to do it safely with good outcomes. I think what gets missed often is in the child's mindset and, and, and the concept of mindfulness. Mindfulness can be a very powerful healing tool for kids and for families to be able to engage the brain or the mind, to be able to exert healing powers on the person's body. One person controls zero, the question obviously comes up, and one person controls the well. Part of being in hospital is being exposed to somebody else's care. Sometimes there's critical events, uh, a kid crashes on the unit. With virtual reality, you can transport them to another experience. When we're able to engage the kid's mind through relaxation, mindfulness practice, guided imagery, that can have a very big influence to control body and get back to
So what I appreciate about that video is it does a really nice job of showing you where VR can be used for pain management, anxiety management, for procedural preparation, and also for wellness. And we'll touch on that again a little bit later. But VR has been used to assess uh, attention uh, deficit hyperactivity disorders. It's been used in rehab to manage phobias and anxiety through exposure or a, a prolonged exposure uh, for the purposes of eating disorders, substance use, behavioral and uh, mental health, mindfulness behavior and, and activities, as well as uh, painful anxiety medical procedures. So we, we can see here, this is uh, work done by a colleague of ours, Dr. Hoffman and David Patterson, um, Hunter Hoffman and David Patterson up at University of Washington for wound care. You, this is one of the very first VR headsets Dr. Pinsky mentioned, sort of the tethering. Uh, now you have sort of a wire-free technology. And you can see how they were doing rehabilitation also around the same time as wound change while this boy was engaged in snow world uh, VR activity. And there's been a, a number of articles written around wound care, cancer and sickle cell pain, routine procedures, chronic pain, as well as uh, pediatric rehabilitation. So again, VR over the last 20 years has started to move into to new areas. Our first study used uh, Bush Soul, which was a, a, the only virtual environment available back in 2002. And we started our research here at CHLA uh, using Bush Soul as a way of interacting in this with music, actually, and dancing and movement and et cetera, to immerse and engage the child in activity uh, while they were going through blood draw, uh, we had four conditions where uh, children were randomized to either no distraction, a cartoon distraction, a flat screen with the same VR or VR through the head mounted display. And we were able to demonstrate that that participants using VR with the head mount reported less pain and less anxiety. We then moved into a more in, in, interactive, engaging environment called virtual uh, street luge which was faster moving. It had sort of finish lines and points and scores and timing, and the kids were more engaged with that. And we used this during um, uh, IV placement for uh, contrast and for radiological procedures using a faces pa faces pain scale revised. And you were able to see that the kids in the VR had a non-significant change in their pain intensity from pre to post, whereas the the participants in the control had a significant increase in their self-reported pain intensity. So this was getting IV placed, and I'll show you some images of that, because we often think that, you know, maybe blood draw and IV sticks aren't that bad, but these are very scary and painful things for kids, and they'll report that pretty regularly. So after doing phlebotomy and IV placement and radiology, we started to expand some of our research in VR around the hospital for um, I, IV placement, cast removal, continuing in phlebotomy, and then also transnasal endoscopy. Uh, this is what some of the standard of care looks like. For those of you maybe who haven't given blood for a while, it, it's still a painful and distressing procedure. And you'll see both, both of these patients are not really having it and they're not really very excited about it. Um, you can see the face grimaces and the, the guarding and the turning away and the reported pain that they experience as a function of placing in a butterfly needle. What we did is we introduced this game for the kids. It's called Bear Blast, which is put out by Applied VR. And they engage in this uh, sort of using this Nerf ball with interacting with these bears. And there's different levels as they climb through. And you also hear the audio coming in as well. And this is what it looks like when a participant is in the VR getting their blood drawn the exact same location as the other kids were. So again, the immersive nature of the VR really t takes the child off to another place where they're not thinking about it. And, you know, we published this work in JAMA reflecting that kids uh, participating in VR versus not have report less anxiety and less pain. And it's actually really good for the, the for the for the caregiver as well as the healthcare provider because when you have a less stressed environment, the parent or the caregiver is happier and the healthcare worker is able to do their work with a lot less distraction as far as a, a kid crying or screaming or yelling or running away. You know, we have kids who run away, you know, they don't want to get stuck with the needle either. Uh, other ongoing projects um, are what we call our sedation sparing projects because Exposure to sedatives, again, these are patients with chronic illnesses that have to come to the hospital frequently. Exposure to chronic um, anesthesia or sedation can have other kinds of influences on socio-emotional development and behavioral and cognitive development. And so we're doing our best to try to reduce the amount of 
of general anesthesia exposure that uh, children get exposed to coming to the hospital routinely. And there's been a, a big literature suggesting that there is a negative impact of sedation and anesthesia on those outcomes. So we're looking at uh, reducing sedation needs in MRI, also through t &E or transnasal endoscopy, and also through endoscopic urological surgeries, where these kids would typically get anesthesia, we're trying to replace that need for anesthesia with VR. Um, we did a collaboration with Disney Junior, uh, Doc McStuffins VR environment. This is important because it was offered in the preoperative area. So again, if you're thinking of the preoperative and the mask induction and the postoperative recovery, you're trying to think about interventions all along the way. So the kids were able to engage in this activity prior to coming into surgery. Um, and I'll show you that video right now. This year, Disney set out to make a real-world impact on kids' lives using the aspirational character, Doc McStuffins, expanding on relationships with Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. Disney partnered with child life experts and pediatricians to develop a one-of-a-kind VR experience aimed at improving the overall patient journey. <laughs> Doc McStuffins, doctor for exam, is the first Disney Marvel VR game targeted towards a younger kid audience. Hi, the game transports patients beyond the walls of the hospital waiting room and into Doc's magical world as they join her at the toy hospital to care for those in need. First, Kids play doctor for a day and focus on helping others. This special program, a collaboration between Disney Channel's World World, Studio Technology and Innovation and Enterprise Social Responsibility provides an opportunity to impact kids' lives by reducing anxiety about their upcoming procedures. There's nothing to be scared of, I promise. Doctor for a Day also features favorite Doc and Stephen's episodes in a never before seen perspective. Reaching beyond VR and into the real world, the immersive patient experience includes a doctor's badge, a sticker sheet, an activity book, and an adorable toy. Utilizing Google's Daydream platform and Unity-based software developed by React Games, Disney brings Doc McStuffin's colorful world to life for patients in this fun, fully interactive VR experience. Doctor for a Day, all part of Disney's ongoing commitment to impacting kids' lives in meaningful ways. So moving along that continuum of care where we're trying to prepare the child when they arrive, prepare them before their procedure, and then take care of them after their procedure, either post-operative, whether it's pain management or recovery, uh, Doc McStuffins was able to help us to have that child be in a more relaxed and a more calm state as he or she would go into surgery. So again, it's a really important sort of target area for decreasing their anxiety and their stress. And kids and the caregivers and their and the healthcare providers were all reporting that the child was doing much better, um, being able to have access to Doc McStuffins um, prior to their surgery than if they were not engaged in other activities when they were very anxious and very worried about their procedure. Um, we've gone on to publish some work with Doc McStuffins. We've also gone on to publish some work around a randomized control trial of VR for, again, acute pain and anxiety management for kids in uh, in the general medical area, demonstrating again that both parents and caregivers, I'm sorry, parents, caregivers, and the patients themselves are reporting less uh, pain and anxiety during IV placement um, in other areas of the hospital outside of radiology. So we've continued this line of research, uh, trying to bring this into a variety of different environments. The other area is mask induction in the OR. So again, preoperatively, and then what we might talk about is perioperatively or right prior to them uh, being inducted with uh, with anesthesia, we've introduced this idea of a combination of using VR for IV placement and then also AR, augmented reality, for mask induction when they're getting um, general anesthesia. So you can see here a child in the OR space undergoing, again, the same kind of IV placement while playing in the Oculus Go. And he was able to say that it calmed him down and made him forget about what was going on around him. And he was very immersed in the activity. Uh, we then used augmented reality, which looks like this. Okay. 
So based on patient's response, the game would speed up or slow down depending on how distressed they were to engage and immerse in more sort of a cognitive load so that the participant was more immersed or more engaged in that activity. And this is what it looks like when they're being wheeled into the OR. You can see they're gaming in the Mira or the, the augmented reality. They're playing that game that you just looked at. Um, and they're smiling and the staff around them are often get laughing or giggling because it's kind of fun for them too um, as this child is coming in for their operation. And so, and at the point of being anesthetized, then they just, their hand lowers and we take the game and the visor away and then the child is ready for surgery. Uh, there's been a lot of work done in VR and it's been advertised, whether it's been in the New York Times or in the Wall Street Journal. But again, in the last 20 years, VR has really made its way into uh, healthcare and pediatrics as well as in adult care. Um, and we've seen that happening here, again, around a lot of variety of sedation sparing and pain and anxiety management. Uh, this is Dr. Barjwa and her team where we're using VR for transnasal endoscopy and we're uh, currently working on a manuscript right now for peer review publication, demonstrating the efficacy of, of using VR, which really enables the child to show up, go through their procedure and go back to school or go home, as opposed to having to be sedated and have to go through a recovery and typically missing school and et cetera. Same with the parents missing work. Now they're able to just sort of come in for the procedure and then go back to their usual daily life. We're also using a, a VR educational platform with Ready Teddy. Uh, Ready Teddy is a, what we call a procedural preparation for the MRI. So it teaches the child how to uh, be familiar with the sounds, the noises, and what it looks like as they slide into the, v, into the MRI for images, uh, which will also help in, again, reducing uh, sedation um, for the, the patients going through MRI. So our data right now in Ready Teddy, our transnasal endoscopy, and arm, which is anal rectal mammometry. We've had about 46 participants in these studies right now. I'm looking at pain and uh, before and before and after satisfaction. 100% of caregivers believe that VR is helping their child through these procedures. So again, in lieu of sedation, we're using VR. So we're getting better anxiety management um, and they're being completely satisfied. And we're seeing changes from pre to peri um, anxiety in both the t &E and also in the ARM participants, as well as pain unpleasantness. So again, we're seeing great clinical outcomes with the kids using VR to manage what would typically be managed with um, GA or sedation. So again, we call these sedation sparing activities. So this has really amazing ramifications for um, uh, helping the child along to either get out, get home, or and also be exposed to a lot less neurotoxic um, uh, chemicals that we discussed in the previous literature showing that these can have negative emotional, behavioral, and cognitive outcomes. Just a quick turn towards where the funding is these days. So you can see the increase in digital therapeutic funding over the years from 20 to 11 to 2020, going from basically uh, $1 billion to $9 billion in digital therapeutics. This includes things like EHR, you know, uh, electric uh, health records, things like uh, smartphone applications, VR, AR, extended reality, a variety of other digital types of therapeutics that are being used right now in healthcare. And we can see also what insurance coverage is looking at right now as far as their openness to digital therapeutics. This is a big issue in, in uh, insurance coverage right now about whether or not if we use these uh, technologies, will the insurance cover, cover that? And so this is still a, a growing area of interest. Other systems like EvoEndo is used, a single disposable uh, t and &E apparatus that is, has a partner in VR uh, for doing uh, scoping. We also have a HypnoVR system that's out there right now that augments hypnotherapy using VR. This is kind of new on the scene for children and adolescents. A recent uh, publication in Pediatric Anesthesia demonstrating the effective effectiveness of augmented reality on preoperative anxiety um, in children and adolescents that just came out this last month using Microsoft HoloLens. Um, and then Kids uh, Smiley Scope, which was a uh, company that, that we partner with here at KidsX at CHLA, recently got FDA clearance to use their Smiley Scope uh, hardware and software for a variety of, of painful medical procedures 
Um, they're the first company to actually receive FDA clearance for a pediatric anxiety management system um, based on some of their randomized control trials. And just to wrap up here, what we have to think about as we move forward is how can we integrate scientifically informed in-clinic VR-based digital therapeutics that can translate into portable uh, either home or in-clinic-based uh, interventions for medical and mental health needs. How are we going to make this much more portable and uh, available to um, in increase access for all users? How do we deal with reimbursement versus cost savings? And how do we demonstrate that to our insurance brokers as well as our institutions? How do we incorporate customizable intrinsic and extrinsic awards and feedback like biosensor tattoos to immerse and engage participants in engaging in the VR activity more? Um, and what about multiplayers? We get a lot of questions about, hey, can we get our families involved in this? Can the can a mother, a father, a grandmother, an auntie join that child in the gaming experience? And so we are talking and looking into multiplayer uh, environments as well. We're moving again into these areas as I've talked about and making good headway in that area. Uh, the phlebotomy has adopted our VR and used that regularly, not as research, but for clinical care if a child would like it. Um, and we're continuing to partner with our, our colleagues around uh, TNE and ARM, um, and also for anesthesia for mask induction. So again, continuing to grow where we're relevant in the institution. All right, let's see here. Okay, I think I'm gonna end there. Thank you all for your time. I'm gonna open it up for questions and stop sharing. We have about 16 minutes. I see some QAs here. Um, I will read the first question um, for both. Let's see, doctors. How is the content curated to show to patients? Can you share if you've collaborated with artists or filmmakers to make media specifically for these use cases? So Dr. Pinsky, do you want to take that first? Unmute yourself. You have to unmute yourself, Dr. Pinsky. Great. In the ongoing clinical trial, where a patient has the choice between a variety of uh, uh, themes, uh, but most of them are focused on relaxation and meditation. Now, whether a more action topic or something which causes laughter, because that's the next question. Yep. How does humor affect, uh, uh, you know, uh, to what effect humor will improve on the on the benefits, we don't know. I mean, the, all, the, all those questions uh, require further studies uh, and should be investigated in the future. Yeah, this is a great question. We have collaborators at USC who 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 do develop multimedia content, and uh, I, I would say to date, uh, most companies develop their own content or in partnership. I think. There's still a lot of work to be done to make it customized sort of developmentally to uh, children, adolescents, young adults, and adults. Ultimately, in the perfect world, you have sort of a VR pharmacy where you have scientific evidence that supports the use of a particular content with a certain age or development um, given a certain medical need or healthcare need. So we're not there yet because this is a relatively new field in the development of software. As we have hardware that's available now off the shelf, right? Now the content is being developed. And I, I agree with the person asking the question that uh, it needs to be more highly specialized and customizable. And that I think is uh, to be determined in the future. And I, I Anybody who's listening, who's involved in virtual reality and who is who is involved in content development, I think, you know, doing focus groups with kids or adolescents and getting feedback and sort of testing that software in its development is very important. But, but mostly to date, people have been developing content um, with their artists or their creators and not necessarily with the populations that they're going to be working with. Yeah, and I just want to add, uh, I showed before the, in my presentation the effect of of disliked music versus liked music uh, on the brain centers of pain. And there's a big difference. So mm -hmm. so something similar is probably happening with the visual uh, impact of VR. Now, again, what contact is the most effective for the patient? It's, this is this is something which needs to be answered in clinical trials. And probably the answer would be 
the in the, there will be an individual approach to every patient uh, uh, because for some some patient uh, hard rock might be very relaxing for other patient classical music and i think the same applies to virtual reality thank you very much for that uh josh Cohen asks how does vr impact children's health and development particularly in terms of sensory motor coordination cyber sickness symptoms like nausea and dizziness the risk of myopia and prolonged exposure uh, cognitive changes observed in animal studies and the intensification of negative emotions compared to traditional gaming. So um, the the issue of sensory motor coordination is that the, the VR activities that we're talking about for healthcare are not prolonged use cases, right? So we use them for very prescribed uses. So for example, using VR during phlebotomy or IV placement or lumbar puncture, or even for... Um, Infusion. So we've talked about, you know, for chemotherapy infusion, there is a, a, a time elapse effect for uh, participants going through VR activities like adventure games while they're being infused with chemotherapy. But the, the, the typical use case is not very long. So we don't have issues around sensory motor coordination. Where it is used to regain coordination, sensory motor coordination, fine and gross motor is in rehab. So that's really interesting. So we actually use VR to retrain and develop somebody who maybe has lost some function as a, as a function of a TBI, a traumatic brain injury, um, or some stroke or some other type of event where we're trying to rehabilitate them, or we're trying to rehabil they rehabilitate them through pain. So in that respect, it works, I think, in the opposite way that the person's asking the question. Cyber sickness-wise, um, we always ask kids around um, their VR usage, whether they get dizzy, lightheaded, nausea, et cetera. We've never had a case of it amongst the children. I think we've had over 500 kids that have gone through our trials. We haven't had any of that kind of cyber sickness. We measure it all the time. I think cyber sickness, uh, dizziness, and nausea and lightheadedness happens more in adults. Maybe it's more of a function of sort of an inner ear type of phenomenon, but we don't see it as much in kids. I will say if if you do feel that way, I've seen it with adults, they just take the VR headset off and the, the dizziness goes away immediately. So um, that hasn't been an issue. I don't know if Dr. Pinsky, you want to say anything about this? I just can, uh, uh, I can talk about the clinical trial which is ongoing and here yep. we haven't seen that problem yet. Uh, yeah. Okay, that's great. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I was wondering if you could expand on research regarding digital health's role for ACEs specifically. Great question. So again, ACEs are um, adverse child experiences. So we know that coming to a, a, a medical hospital is an ACE, especially if something traumatic has happened to you or if you're coming for routine chronic care. Um, so there is not, the, the role of digital health in ACEs specifically is probably a newly developing phenomenon because there are groups that are looking at trauma or PTSD treatment on smartphones, um, web-based, uh, as well as like things like you know trauma-focused CBT, um, but more into that, as it's moving into the telehealth space, we're going to see more data coming around with regards to care and ACEs. So I would say it's new. I think what I presented at the very beginning around questions around the role of VR in healthcare and its attempts to minimize ACEs is that we know kids come to the hospital, we know they go through scary, painful procedures, and VR is one way to attempt to minimize that. I mean, we're never going to have kids skipping down the halls to get their blood drawn, but if we have kids having a positive experience, remembering that they got to use VR when they had their blood drawn, it may lessen their anxiety or their fear. So we're trying to we're trying to reduce again those ACEs that are a function of coming to the hospital. But I think that the in the near future, in the next five or 10 years, we're going to be seeing a much bigger impact of digital digital health on ACEs, whether that's going to be through telehealth, VR, or digital therapeutics through the use of apps through smartphones. I think this is going to be something that will be coming in the next 10 years. All right, somebody else had asked a question about dizziness, motion, or sickness. We I think we already answered that. Okay, okay. All right, I think we have answered all the questions that have come in so far. So Dr. Pinsky, uh, what other applications do you imagine 
VR or VR and music may have in your institution, since you mostly work with adults who are coming through for oncology care, what other types of applications do you see uh, being a good testing ground for VR and music? And music, yeah. I mean, just for VR, I see already a lot of other applications in the adult cancer population. Um, for example, uh, when they're getting infused with a certain treatment, uh, uh, anti-cancer therapy, at the same time, they could be watching a, a three-dimensional VR video explaining the mechanism of action of that drug they're receiving, how mm -hmm. it actually affects the cancer. That's something uh, which obviously the cancer would have to be created, but I see there will be educational at the same time, potentially even therapeutic to, to do something like this. Um, now with music, we still, we know music is very effective. We know VR is effective in situations like uh, related to anxiety, pain in, in cancer patients. Now, whether, whether both approaches can have a longer term effect on, on the disease itself, that we, what we are studying here, acute situation, acute pain or uh, anxiety associated with certain procedures. But what are, what are the effects uh, of this intervention long-term on the disease cause of, of the patient? Uh, you know, those are all questions which uh, I think it should right. be addressed in the future. Yeah, I think that um, the mechanisms of action question is always something people want to know about. And I really appreciate that in the research that you're doing and the trials that you're you're conducting right now, you are looking at biological indices because that has been something that's been missing in the field is what is the impact of VR on particular biological outcomes? And I think we always get that question. So it's good to see that you're you're covering that in your current trials. And I encourage VR researchers um, of the future to be thinking about that too. What is the what is the physiological activity that's being impacted by VR that may be sparing for the for the participant or the patient with the condition? What are the biological, the physiological, and even the chemical? I mean, we've talked in in previous literature about what's the impact of the the top down inhibitory pathways of being immersed and engaged in an activity like VR, and what that top down impact chemically has on the body. You know, does it calm? Does it soothe? Does it relax? And when you have that, when you spike that kind of response, then you, again, you're you're more robust and you're more resilient to having negative outcomes. And I think that's, again, the, the, the coming together of VR technology in the healthcare space is um, it's often referred to as a distraction and it's not a distraction. We know neurobiologically, it's much more than a distraction, but people say that term pretty loosely and pretty freely. But when we actually drill down, we start to learn much more deeply about the physiological implications, the biological implications, and the chemical implications. And I think it's important that we study that. Um, we study that. I think I I made mention of it in one of my last slides about using those those kind of tattoo band-aids that pick up physiological data, that physiological data could potentially manipulate or change the environment that the person's in, right? So uh, one company that developed some mindfulness relaxation content does have it based on breath work. And through that person's breath work, they can change their environment um, and have an impact on their experience that they're having in that virtual environment. So I think we're starting to get more sophisticated ways of both developing content and also how it interacts with us um, as the as the person who's uh, engaged in that virtual environment. Okay. Um, I would um, encourage all of you who had a chance to watch today and, and thank you for watching today, but encourage you to uh, send uh, any of your colleagues to um, our website, USCIIHW, where uh, the Institute for Integrative Health and Wellness uh, lands, and you can find content uh, from our past presentations, have a chance to rewatch that and or send it to any of your colleagues that might be interested in this content. And um, I want to thank Dr. Pinsky for his work and his time and his presentation today. And I enjoy collaborating with Dr. Pinsky. He is a part of our executive steering committee here at IIHW. And I'm looking forward to our, our future work together. And thank you again all for joining us today. And if you have questions, you can feel free to email him or I 
Um, Dr. Pinsky is at USC at the Comprehensive uh, Cancer Center, the Norris Center. He's easily findable, as am I. You can reach me through my email address, um, which is in the, uh, the chat right now. And uh, again, thank you so much for attending today. We hope that uh, you have more questions than answers. That's what I always like to say in, in science, that we actually, we've learned some things, but we have more questions now, uh, which will inform some of our future research and science. So thank you all. We hope you have a wonderful holiday and uh, join our mailing list so you can hear about our up and coming activities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Pinsky. Thank you. Thank you.